Uh, Richard Venus will give us some insight into Todd's involvement in electrical engineering. And Richard acquired his interest in electrical in engineering heritage matters more than 30 years ago when he was working for the Electricity Trust of South Australia. In 1995, he joined the local Heritage Committee of Engineers Australia and is currently chairman of the Engineering Heritage SA Committee. He's also a member of the History Council of South Australia. In 2008, Richard received an award of merit from the National Board of Engineering Heritage Australia, and he was delighted that the presentation occurred on the same night that Sir Charles Todd was inducted into the South Australian Engineering Hall of Fame. Richard. Thank you, Rob, and uh, thank you, Mac, <coughs> for going through the extraordinary and uh, very taxing task of making this event happen. It's a, a wonderful achievement, and I'm privileged to be part of it. The title of my talk is Charles Todd, the Government Electrician. Now, this was something that many people referred to Todd as, and it was also a term that Todd used to describe himself. And what we need to uh, remember is that in the mid to late 1800s, this was a term of deep significance, signifying someone who had achieved eminence in the developing field of electrical science and its application. These days, in fact, since about the 1920s, we tend to think of an electrician as being someone with a tool belt and a hard hat uh, working on a building site. Uh, Todd's role, I think we would have to say, has to be more like the professional engineer, maybe still with the hard hat, but with a, a laptop computer. But even that doesn't describe the understanding of what an electrician was. As I said, he was uh, part scientist, part practical engineer. And as a member of that profession, we are very proud to claim him, uh, as indeed all of the other societies are. He was a member of the Institution of Electrical Engineers. Uh, in fact, he was elected, um, it was then the Society of Telegraph Engineers, and uh, Stephen Gillam Smith um, sent me a note the other day saying that he has a copy of uh, Todd's application papers dated the 10th of December 1873. Uh, unfortunately, Todd was never a fellow of the Institution of Engineers because that grade of membership was not introduced until the 1960s. But uh, as a member of the uh, institution, that was regarded as a graceful and well-merited recognition of faithful services and high technical skills. Uh, closer to home, as Rob's already mentioned, uh, Todd was uh, inducted into the local engineering hall of fame. As we've heard from Dennis when uh, Charles and uh, uh, sorry, as we've heard from Rob when Charles and uh, Alice arrived here, Adelaide was a very different place to the one that we know. It was difficult and dangerous to get around, and uh, Charles was moved to remark that his experience as the supervisor of the galvanic apparatus at Greenwich would enable him to render electric light available. And he, he stated his intention shortly to make some experiments. But then he went off and started building these damn telegraph lines which got in the road of his electrical engineering. However, it uh, took until 1860, but he eventually found time in what was clearly an extraordinary working schedule to give Adelaide's first public demonstration of electric light. This was on the 2nd of October. 1860, it was in a building called White's Rooms, and those of us who are old enough and live in Adelaide might remember the uh, majestic theatre. Uh, White's Rooms was somewhere in that area, and uh, it was a venue hall. There was a crowd of 800 people who turned out to see this demonstration, and the chairman was uh, the governor, uh, Sir Richard uh, MacDonald. The telegraph demonstration, well, that didn't work all that well. However, he also demonstrated the electric light. It was of dazzling brilliancy, and though proceeding from so small a point, illuminated the room more brightly than all the gas lights with which it is usually lighted. 
Todd, of course, was demonstrating an electric arc lamp that was uh, invented by um, Sir Humphrey Davy in about 1808, some sources say as early as 1802. Todd repeated this light show uh, a little later for the inaugural polytechnic soiree. Now, I think that's something that we ought to bring back. <laughs> 29th of uh, January 1861 at the opening of the new Institute building, which of course is still there on the corner of Kintore Avenue, Charles exhibited in a in countless number of dazzling experiments the wonders of the electric light. Uh, a few years later, in October 1867, uh, Todd at another meeting at the SA Institute explained the construction of a new electric lamp, which he was going to use on the occasion of a visit of the Duke of Edinburgh, and which he said would throw a shadow for a distance of a mile or a mile and a half. And the lamp that he was demonstrating was of the Jude Bosque design, and this is what it looked like, uh, the carbon electrodes. Now, because these electrodes are consumed at different rates with the DC system, there was the need to have at the bottom uh, of this apparatus, this uh, complex mechanism to not only maintain the arc gap, but to feed the rods at different rates. Uh, this is the mechanism from a commercially produced Dubosk lamp, and the lamp that Todd was going to demonstrate was one that he had actually made himself with his own hands, which is just an extraordinary insight into the fact that he was a practical electrician as well as a sound scientist. He set this lamp up on the roof of the telegraph office and in those days the telegraph office was here, uh, this is Curry Street, uh, in a place called Green's Exchange. Todd's office was actually just to the left of the entrance door. So he had this apparatus set up here on the top of uh, Green's Exchange. And we can see the relative positions of this in my favourite illustration. So here's the telegraph office just here on the corner of Grenfell Street. Uh, Townsend Durier had his photographic studio and the night before these two guys had got hold of some magnesium flash powder and were firing off lights at each other. Uh, it sounded like a couple of young blokes uh, having a bit of fun. But when Todd struck the arc, it lit up the whole of King William Street from Government House all the way through to Victoria Square. It was so great as to dazzle with its excessive brilliancy the eyes of all who ventured to look upon it even from incredible distances. <laughs> A very profound demonstration, the electrical engineering story. Uh, then um, fast forwards to 1879 because Todd was a Building. 1879 was a significant year for electric street lighting. In Cleveland, Ohio, Charles Brush had installed an electric lighting system, and this is a, uh, a central type of power station to the Brush design that apparently was intended to be installed at Adelaide at some stage. But um, in Adelaide, in 1879, the council had yet another discussion with the gas company they couldn't agree on the, the rate. So in Ohio, they have electric lighting. In Adelaide, we go back to kerosene. However, the council sought a report from Todd as government electrician on the practicability of lighting the streets of, city, of the city by means of the electric light. It was also in 1879 that Todd's former assistant, uh, Edward Cracknell, and uh, there's Cracknell later in life. Uh, he was now superintendent of telegraphs in uh, New South Wales. Uh, and uh, in a similar demonstration, he's also dazzled the citizens of Sydney with uh, an electric arc lamp, much as Todd had done uh, several years beforehand. In 1881, Todd borrowed from him uh, most significantly a dynamo, so instead of having batteries to supply the electric uh, lamp, uh, there was a machine driving an electric dynamo, again with a Dubosk style of arc lamp, this time with a parabolic reflector. He mounted a demonstration in somewhat cramped quarters up here in the top of the tower, 
and uh, he thought that four of these things could light up the whole of uh, King William Street. The equipment was then taken down to the exhibition grounds where the annual exhibition was taking place and uh, was set up outside and the register said it was lit with a brilliancy almost equal to that of day and it was something that caused a great deal of confusion to the poor flowers that had been planted outside. <laughs> uh, Todd then invited the City Council to another demonstration. Uh, this was on the 19th of October 1881, so Edwin Smith, who, like Todd, was another cricket tragic, uh, they trotted across the road and Todd again set up the equipment and demonstrated the light and uh, Edwin Smith, who was the mayor, thought that the results might be very beneficial indeed to the citizens. As it turned out, what we 1881 is another 14 years before they actually got an electric light. But there was intense interest at this time in lighting public buildings. Uh, Todd had been sent to Sydney and Melbourne in June 82 to inspect installations and provide a report to Parliament and this is uh, Swanston Street in uh, about that period. The next year, May 83, uh, Todd's parliamentary boss, who was the Minister for Education, which is an interesting thing, Todd's department, that was where it fitted, he went to see the Melbourne works of the Australian Electric Light and Power Company and asked for an estimate for lighting the GPO. Uh, Charles Todd himself had recommended electric lighting for the new institute buildings. Now it should come as no surprise that Todd was a member of the institute board and this was the buildings that they had planned. We would recognise what is the Ortlock wing of the State Library and then a further extension which was to house the uh, museum. Unfortunately the government who controlled the purse strings were loath to commit to a system which was, to be fair, still fairly much in its infancy. As we've heard uh, a little later in uh, 1885, uh, the Charles Todd and one of his daughters, we haven't quite been able to work out uh, which of the two likely candidates it was, possibly uh, Gwen uh, went with him. Uh, he went to England where, amongst other things, he received his honorary MA from Cambridge and this is the academic dress that's in the portrait in the GPO. When Todd returned in May 86, everyone's attention was very much taken up in the pre preparations for the Jubilee International Exhibition that was going to result in the construction of this uh, magnificent building on the North Terrace, of which only a small flight of stairs at the back of the building remain to this day. This exhibition, and I hate to support this uh, Eastern States rivalry, but this exhibition, which just reinforces what you were saying earlier, uh, was in fact more successful than the equivalent ones in Sydney and Melbourne because it was the first in Australia to be lit with electric light, which meant people could attend at night. So of course it was going to be more successful. Also in 87, there was the South Australian Electrical Society was formed. Tuesday, 19th of April, uh, it was formed with the object of creating a deep uh, interest in subjects connected with electricity. Amongst younger members of the service, no prizes for guessing who was elected president. In 1888, this is following the Jubilee exhibition, there are a lot of industrial exhibits were brought here, and uh, you'll smile at this. Uh, there was a great deal of interest in using these uh, displays as the nucleus of a technology museum, and indeed such a thing was formed, along with a school of mines and industry. The council of the school included uh, Charles Todd, and uh, they decided, and clearly they had more autonomy than the Institute, they decided to buy one of these things, which is a gas engine, and that was going to be used to drive a dynamo to provide lighting uh, for the premises, but also to make practical classes in electrical engineering at the School of Mines. And Charles Todd recommended the services of a young fellow, uh, an Irish engineer who could be in charge of the uh, electric lighting plant. His name was Morris Grant 
and uh, we need to do some more work on him because Morris Grant effectively founded the electricity supply industry in South Australia and certainly founded the company that was the forerunner of uh, what used to be my former sainted employer, Exxon. Uh, this is actually a brushed lighting plant, uh, a rather large one that was installed in New York that uh, gives you some idea of the, uh, the dynamos and the lights were switched on for the first time on Wednesday the 29th of January 1890. The very next day, the South Australian Parliament appointed an electric lighting board of inquiry to look into lighting at, government, at the Parliament House. The board included Todd, of course, and also this fellow, uh, Roland Rees, who is a, an architect and civil engineer. A couple of his uh, architectural projects, again for Adelaide people, include the British Hotel and the Newmarket Hotel on the corner of uh, north and west terraces. So this was uh, uh, the standard of Rees work. He was also a tireless champion for electrical lighting. So this committee of inquiry was, uh, was formed. Uh, Rees in fact uh, along with Edwin Smith had been absent when the decision was made about lighting the chambers of the new Parliament House. Uh, the chairman of the building committee, Sir Henry Ayres, had cast the deciding vote in favour of lighting the new house with gas. So these are gas lamps. However, they were ignited with electricity. <laughs> Rees pointed out that this was hardly an impartial decision. Ayres was, after all, chairman of the South Australian Gas Company. <laughs> So, as he was saying, nothing changes. <laughs> However, Rees at least had been successful in having the proposal re-examined. Uh, the board or the commission, of course, went east to see what was happening there. Uh, they travelled to Melbourne and carried on some inspections. Uh, Todd then went on to Sydney, where he had to attend the, uh, this is the Sydney Town Hall, uh, where he attended the postal conference during the day and at night he inspected various electrical lighting installations around the city. He was very much pleased with what he saw, although he thought that uh, in respect of electric lighting, Altman was further advanced than Sydney. And in one of those curious little things that you discover when you set out, and uh, again, Mac, I thank you for the opportunity to go off and spend the last couple of months uh, digging deeper, uh, I discovered that Todd was showing the latest Edison phonograph and he was delighted with it. And he even recorded his own message of congratulations on a cylinder for Edison. And I like to think that somewhere up there at the Henry Ford Museum in Michigan, amongst all those Edison cylinders that have still been preserved, there might be one that has Charles Todd's voice on it. Now, what an exciting thought that is. The Commission of Inquiry presented their report in April 1890. Not surprisingly, they recommended that electric lighting be installed and further that uh, Charles Todd should be requested to take control of the installation and its completion to ensure that it met the highest standards appropriate to the Parliament. The uh, light was uh, set up and this is looking behind uh, the, what was called the West Wing of Parliament House. This is the back of the old uh, building on North Terrace. Uh, these are some buildings of the railway station. So somewhere in here this lighting plant was set up and it was first trialled on Wednesday the 3rd of June 1891. Uh, Todd himself had to wait until 1893 to get his own building, the General Post Office, lit with electricity. But electric lighting was now very firmly established as uh, a viable alternative to gas. Uh, to some extent the mantle of um, Todd the electrician passed to his younger son Headley who in 1892 was made the uh, South Australian agent for the Brush Electrical Engineering Company with um, Morris Grant as his resident engineer. However, Charles continued to watch these developments with interest and he was present at a number of these significant events in electrical engineering, not the least of which was in 1898 when the colony's first power station 
was built. Uh, the foundation stone, which is here, was laid in 1898, not in Adelaide, but at Port Adelaide. The council there were able to make that decision more quickly than the Adelaide Council could, and amongst the guests was Charles Todd. But Todd still had one new venture to master, and Max asked me to particularly talk about this, uh, this topic. I can see Rob, uh, Rob's finger heading towards the uh, buzzer, but uh, I am now in time on to say something about wireless telegraphy. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. This um, rather windswept place, probably as cold and wet as we are this morning, is the lighthouse on one of the Althorpe Islands. This is a little group of islands below the toe of York Peninsula. It sits between York Peninsula and Kangaroo Island, and it was obviously one of the two ways to get into the Gulf out here. And uh, this needed to be in telegraphic communication. Charles Todd had ordered a special heavy shore end cable from England, but the action of the waves over the rocky seabed soon started to produce problems. Now this is the sort of coastal conditions that uh, we have in that particular area, so uh, even a well insulated cable is laid across this type of uh, terrain and the action of the waves and there's a constant, constant story. This is actually, Matt, you'll be pleased to know, quite a long story which I have abbreviated severely. But uh, it really is worth uh, reading about. Uh, the Marine Board asked Todd to investigate an alternative means of uh, communication, and he said, I have no doubt that we shall be able to establish communication with the lighthouse uh, between the lighthouse and the mainland on your peninsula by Marconi's system. And he set to work on this particular project with his son in law. Uh, William Bragg, who had given the first public demonstration in Australia of wireless telegraphy using the Marconi system at the university on the 21st of September 1897. And Bragg had also met Marconi himself uh, in a visit to England. They carried out various trials working uh, from the observatory building, and what a shame we still don't have that on West Terrace. And by about May 1899, they were able to establish communication over a distance of about 200 yards. <laughs> Three days later, they managed to achieve communication over the measured mile uh, to a receiver they had uh, down on South Road. And on Friday the 23rd of June, they successfully transmitted messages to a temporary receiving station at Henry Beach which is about the same distance from the observatory as the gap that they had to span for the Althorps. This was the apparatus that they used. Uh, we've already seen a small picture of that in one of the previous presentations. The only thing that I recognise in this is uh, the spark gap. Uh, they proved that it worked, but as Todd feared, it was too expensive to proceed with, so work was abandoned in February 1900. The story of the Althorps continues. One year in desperation, they sent carrier pigeons down there. <laughs> it eventually took until the Second World War before the Althorps were issued with a pedal wider set, which enabled them to communicate with the Cape Order on Kangaroo Island. And from there, there was a telephone link to the mainland. The conclusion to all of this is Todd, the electrical engineer, would come in, uh, the last words come on the 19th of November 1901, when Adelaide's first power station was opened in Grenfell Street. Uh, this is the first stage of the building. Uh, a second stage built the office to a two-storey structure, which is today's Tandania. I'm sure Charles was present but I don't have a document to actually prove that. His son was certainly there, Headley and his business partner, Joseph Samuel, had a display. But the register, and I find this, uh, this is a wonderful sense of history, the register reminded its readers of Charles Todd's legacy. The electric light is no new thing in Adelaide, they said. 41 years ago, that's 1860, Sir Charles Todd, then plain mister, gave a demonstration of light at the opening of the Institute on North Terrace. Now, that wasn't strictly correct. 
The 1860 demonstration was at his lecture in White's Rooms. The demonstration at the opening of the building was in 1861. But the register very properly recognised Charles Todd's role in honouring his undertaking in 1856 with respect to electric light, and that was to render it available. 